Welcome to the Prog Talks by the Prog Space. Welcome to the Prog Talks, an interview series by the Prog Space, where we will be talking to musicians in all corners of the progressive music scene. Welcome back to another episode of the Prog Talks. I'm your host, Dario. And uh, before we start, as always, uh, my little hint to that cup of tea that or coffee that you could get us if you like what we're doing. We're... We appreciate all your support and uh, your loyalty. But now I want to, um, yeah, say hi to our guest today. And that's Evan Berry calling from uh, Boston or the Boston area. Is that right? Or where, where you're at? Hey, um, I'm actually on the West Coast. I, I, recently, oh. moved to Cal- I recently moved to California. So I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm actually all the way on the other side. <laughs> but so- I was in Boston for a little bit. Oh wow! So 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 it's uh, it's early in the morning for you right now. It is, yeah. I just uh, I just had my first coffee, so I'm. Uh, I think I'm. I think I'm pretty. Uh, maybe still a little sleepy, but I think I'm pretty awake. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah. Before before we start talking about your new album, I have to ask. Uh, I have to uh, ask you to. Please tell us which band you're in because I'm I'm a little bit afraid of uh, not pronouncing it correctly. <laughs> I have to admit. Uh, yeah, no worries. So I am in Wilderun. We uh, that's that's how we say it. We say Wilderun. Um, to be fair, I got it. We got the the song title or the uh, band name from a from a book. So uh, for all I know. It could be pronounced some, in a different way. Obviously, a lot of our fans, a lot of people say Wild Run or Wilder Run. Um, and that's that's fine. But we we, <laughs> we say Wilder Run. That's that's how we like to pronounce it. Okay. Yeah. And uh, you guys have a very, very fresh new album out since last week. Um, Epigon. It's your fourth album. It's out on Century Media Records. The first album you guys are putting out through a label. Is that correct? Yes, indeed. Yeah, we um, well, the last record which we originally released independently, we we did a, a re-release through Century Media. So oh yeah, sort of right. Like I, a, I I remember I remember now. Um, but yeah, how how has the 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 reception been so far for you for you guys with Epigon? Uh, it's been good for sure. It's o- overall been been quite positive. Um, I think it's one of those things where a lot of people are still digesting it. I can tell that uh, this is the case with a lot of our music is that it seems like some, at least some of it takes a little while for uh, people to really sink their teeth into. Uh, we don't honestly don't even really intend to make it this way. This, you know, but just something about the way that we write music, it just always seems like I, I keep reading these reviews of people being like, yeah, I think I like it, but I need <laughs> to give it more time. <laughs> you know, uh, and that that's honestly, we're used to that at this point, Pro- probably with the exception of our very first record. All the other records we've made, it always seems like there's a certain amount of people that just need a little time to come around. So I'll be curious to see what happens after a month or two, see if maybe uh, some people's opinions change or get better, or maybe get worse. I don't know, but... Uh, <laughs> Overall, it's been positive so far, for sure. Yeah, well, uh, the you, you're jumping right into my que- my first question or, or my first uh, proper proper question. I would say um, with that as um, yeah, the previous album you just mentioned it, Veil of Imagination. Um, that was, I think, was a massive breakthrough success. I would say from from what I what I've seen in the worldwide metal and prog scene, um, it definitely got your name out there, and yeah. um, it had the, like a massive epic sound. And um, I think it was uh, quite a task to come up with a successor to that album. And um, now with Epigon, you you are there. There's there's some surprising elements in there as it's um maybe not as immediate and uh, not uh, um like there's there's a lot of more introspective uh passages and all that um on epigon that 
might come as a surprise. Um, so uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the um, yeah conception of Epigon, how how you you um, yeah how the the songwriting um, went and and how it might have been different to the songwriting and recording process of uh, Veil of Imagination. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, I, I think you're right. I think that there's certainly a few less immediate moments. Um, I mean, even with Veil of Imagination, I, I think if you listen to that record from the beginning, it is still, a, a take, can take a little while. You know, we opened that record with a 14-minute song that doesn't, that takes a little while to kick in. We did the same with the record beforehand. I don't know. I don't know why we do this, but just something about the way we write it. Just we just always take our time at the beginning. But I, I will say that Veil of Imagination, um, a couple of the singles, I think maybe just caught you know a little bit more memorable melodies right from the start. And uh, so I can understand why that might have caught a few more people's ears um, that, than some of the new material. But um, in terms of the uh, uh, the new stuff, yeah, like basically it was it was interesting because right after Veil vale was finished, or pretty pretty soon after Veil vale was completed and released, I had started writing some new material that was very similar. It was like along the same lines as Veil. Vale. I have I have a couple songs kind of in the in the demo still in demo format that are are pretty close in in you know tone and atmosphere to veil of imagination but after i wrote those couple songs or you know they're kind of like half songs um i kind of just fell off of that and i started to feel like i started to feel like that path was just retreading too much it started to feel like if i followed that path a little too much a farther it would just feel like veil of imagination part two it would and, and probably like the lesser version it would just feel a little bit like retreading you know like and 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 for me i think that i the the that material, those songs I do like, like I'm, I'm hoping to revisit them at some point and, and use them for maybe future world run songs. But I just think it wasn't the right time. I think in order to take that little bit more bombastic kind of eccentric sound that was more present on Veil, I just need more time with it. I need to let it sit. I need to come back to it later. So because of that, after I you know, got through those couple songs, I was kind of sitting around and thinking to myself, okay, well, if I don't want to do that, then what do, what do I want to do? What do we want to do for album number four? And then I started revisiting some other material that I had actually written for that I was not originally intended for Wilderon. It was intended for just some sort of side project. I'd written it a while ago and, you know, Wilderon began as this more, folk metal project when we first began and so this material i had written around the same time and just put it aside and because of the fact that wilderness sort of evolved and changed over the course of almost 10 years uh it i now realized hey this different material actually sort of works now it, it's not it's not exactly what i would have originally thought as wilderun but now that we've sort of expanded our horizons more i felt like okay this might actually work um and then you know then i kind of took that material and then started messing with it i started picking it apart i started rewriting some of it i started adding new parts i started taking out some parts you know just messing with it but that was sort of the template um and yeah and because it was written a, a lot of the source material was written written a while ago i, I think it has an innately different character um mm -hmm. and it's a little less obvious it's melodic but I, I feel like it's less obviously melodic it's almost a little bit more harmonic it's a, a focus is mm -hmm. a little bit more on the harmony it focuses a little bit more on atmosphere in certain parts and um yeah i don't know i i feel like album to album we just want to do something slightly different so we never get bored and we never get 
you know, stale. So that's why we went that route. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, actually, the first album, uh, the first Wilderon album, I I I really listened to was uh, Veil of Imagination, and I, I remember back then when it kind of blew up. Um, uh, of course, one of the singles uh, was Far From Where Dreams Unfurl with that super hooky earworm. And mm -hmm. I remember a couple of friends uh, dubbing uh, Wilder Run as the like Disney Opeth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, I, but I have the feeling that um, uh, th that wouldn't um, fit uh, the, the Epigon Wilder Run anymore. <laughs> That's it's a, it's a little less Disney, <laughs> probably. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, so, so when you, um, you, you just, uh, told us a little bit about, um, yeah, the origin origins of the songs, um, that they were kind of different than before, but now when going further into the, into the production process, um, at what point do you do, do the other band members, um, like join and 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 how do you work on arrangements and and because i think um both uh bass player daniel miller and uh and wayne ingram are are also credited especially for the uh orchestrations right mm -hmm. and so i think that 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 uh that is a huge is it, it is a huge part of of the wilder run sound and um oh, yeah. obviously a a a song can be a finished song, but then the orchestration can make it a totally different song without changing the songwriting itself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, the way that Wilderon has always worked more or less is, is that I, you know, I, I'm kind of the core songwriter, but if, if it was just me, if, you know, I was in charge of everything and the final product was, only me it would definitely sound a lot different it would sound you know probably much more just band oriented more stripped down and, and probably just a little bit more monotone from a texture standpoint and uh which is why you know after i've written that sort of core structure and you know i basically like i'll just write everything on a combination of guitar and piano and just kind of switch between those two But that's kind of it for me. Like I, after I've finished the structure on my own, it's kind of, I'm kind of like, okay, well, this is it. And I, you know, obviously write like the vocal melodies and, and lyrics and things like that. But um, I, I almost feel more like a singer songwriter than, than anything else. <laughs> and then, but yeah, so then well before we enter the studio, I will, you know, I'll, I'll make the, I'll make demos. They're very just kind of rough, simple demos and I'll, and I'll send them to the rest of the guys. And then we have, um, we have like a lot of long meetings about, about the songs. Well, basically, you know, obviously this time around, but actually most times because we, we've always been a somewhat remote band, we'll have, you know, meetings over zoom or, you know, FaceTime or whatever. And we'll, uh, So even before the pandemic, <laughs> even, yeah, even before the pandemic, we would do this because, well, Wayne, uh, you know, I was out in Boston or in Massachusetts with with Dan, but then Wayne has been in L.A. for, you know, eight years now. So just because of his life and his job. So we've had to, you know, be communicating digitally for a long time now. So we're kind of used to it. But um, anyways, we would do these long video chats where we would just go through the demo and make, you know, a long list of notes. We would do timestamps and be like, okay, so at this moment, how do we want it to sound? At this moment, how do we want it to sound? A lot of that had to do with orchestration, but it actually goes even beyond that. It would go, you know, we would talk about the band arrangement. We would talk about like, you know, do we even though I wrote this on guitar, do we even have guitar play this part? Like maybe guitars should drop out here and, you know, it's only bass and drum and a synth or something, you know, like it would, it would just be these really long in-depth discussions about texture and color. Like, even though I provided the harmony and melody, uh, I, the band would all decide collectively how to dress it, basically how to, mm -hmm. how to, 
you know, and that, yeah, again, that, that has to do with the instrumentation of the band. That has to do with orchestration. And that has, especially on Epigon, we really started to incorporate more synthetic textures, more, you know, Dan is in particular was the kind of the guy behind all the synth things happening. And, you know, Dan has a long history of electronic music. And he's, so we tried to subtly incorporate some of those things in a way that still felt like Wilderun. So, uh, yeah, so basically we would all have those really long discussions and, and timestamp notes and then just work through it. And then obviously John, um, our drummer, you know, even though my, my demos this time around actually didn't have any drums on them. So John was given a lot of freedom to, mm -hmm. to create the drum parts he wanted to create. So that, that was, you know, his contribution as well. So yeah, there's, there's a lot that goes into it after I've written that core skeleton of a song for sure. All right. Yeah. You mentioned the other three members now and, and what their roles are. Um, looking up on, on, on the metal archives, um, there's uh, Joe Gettler as lead guitarist uh, until 2021 so so is he still on the album or did did you guys uh like uh wayne and you did you did you play all the guitars uh this time uh, joe joe is the lead guitarist on epicon yeah it's it's been a little confusing we've had to we've had to clarify it with some people we, we some reviews are coming in and i can tell that uh Some people are a little confused about it, but uh, especially, and I totally understand because Wayne is playing the guitar in the music videos, so I get why I get why that would be confusing for some. But um, yeah, no, Joe uh, unfortunately had to leave the band recently just because of his his job and his personal life, and mm -hmm. uh, it was totally amicable, and we're all still great friends, so every everything is great there, but. Um, But yeah, unfortunately, he did have to leave the band. But basically, the last thing he did before um, before leaving was record the lead guitars on on Epigon. So, but, yeah, but it, it actually worked out pretty nicely because um, Wayne actually was the original lead guitarist when we first started the band. Then, because he had to move back to California, and he, you know, was just focusing on his his job and his his life, uh, he was unable to tour playing any shows for a good few years which is why joe joined the band oh all right but then, but then now it kind of reversed again where luckily as soon as joe told us that he, he had to leave um wayne was in a good enough position where he could sort of take the reins again and um so yeah it, it kind of worked out we i wasn't at first i was a little worried we we're gonna have to hunt for someone new but We didn't, so it worked. <laughs> All right, um, yeah, that 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 also uh, brings us to to an important uh, part of the music as well, playing it live. And and you guys uh, have been lucky enough to to play a little tour recently, right? Um, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, we just finished up a whole month long tour here in the states with uh, Swallow the Sun and Abigail Williams. Oh wow, that's. A Brilliant package. I mean, it's a very diverse package. Um, I, I have to, I have to say, I'm not too familiar with Abigail Williams, um, but uh, but yes, yeah, Wallow the Sun is an amazing band. Um, so so so, how was it uh, to to bring uh, some of the the Epigon material to the stage, especially maybe after after the long time that 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 it wasn't possible to play live. Yeah, it was um, it was really satisfying to just. I mean, honestly, after almost two years, we could have you know pretty much played any show that was given to us if it was you know possible. We were just you know desperate to to get back on stage. So it was it was great. Um, you know, it was a little at, at first we were a little apprehensive just you know about the obviously the state of the world and everything. It was a little bit we were, we were a little nervous, but you know we're all smart and safe people so we just we just you know we're trying to be as smart about it as we could and, and luckily you know everyone on the tour was able to stay safe for the whole month and uh and so we got we definitely got lucky in that sense um but it was good though it was um you know we had 
we, we definitely felt a little bit robbed of a lot of our veil of imagination touring cycle because we released that album in November of 2019. Yeah. And then I, I think we had a grand total of eight shows we got mm-hmm. to play on that record and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> And then, and then we had, to, and then we had to stop because uh, you know I, I, for obvious reason. So, and then we had, I think it was four different tours canceled on us over the course of 2020 and 2021. You know, we we had one that I actually was. There's a um, a Canadian band called Aeternum that uh, is really great that we were planning on touring the U.S. and Canada with. If you are enjoying this interview, please head over to theprogspace.com for more reviews, articles, pictures and interviews all about progressive music. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. theprogspace.com Um, Evan, you were just telling us uh, about the tour with Eternam um, that got cancelled. That you were like, I think you were just saying that you worked uh, like that you put a lot of work in into planning that tour, right? Yeah, yeah. It was it was particularly frustrating because it was a you know it was a self book tour. Us, uh, me, and uh, one of the guys from Eternum, you know, spent. A couple months, you know, just self booking an entire well, two weeks, maybe a little bit more than two weeks, but you know, still a lot of work to, to book your own tour and, you know, all ready to go. And then, you know, we probably finished up all the planning only two or three weeks before everything shut down. And so, anyways, it was that was a bummer. And then we had maybe two or three other tours that were in the works that were, you know, tentatively planned that. That got canceled. Two, two of which were going to Europe. We've still never been to Europe, and uh, and we were really excited. And then those, you know, obviously got shut down. So, anyways, point is that the Swallow the Sun Abigail Williams tour was a very welcome uh, return to the stage. Even though you know it was a little, it was a little nerve wracking at times. Uh, it was a lot of fun. There were a lot of great shows. Um, and like you said, it was sort of a diverse musical package. You know, it's kind of a uh, swallow the sun is obviously a lot more gloomy than we are, but uh, yeah, they also have some epic kind of symphonic things going on. And then Abigail Williams is much more of a black metal band, but uh, they still have an atmospheric kind of side to them that's really cool. And I thought it was a really cool package. They're both really good bands, and uh, a lot of the crowds really just seem to appreciate seeing some live music and yeah it was good absolutely awesome glad to hear it and i really hope you you guys will be able to finally make the trip here to europe um especially the prog power europe festival has been a mainstay in my life for more than 10 years i have to say so uh, that was uh, that we were we were planned on on playing that in 2020 we were booked for that and that we were that that we were looking forward to that so much so it was was a but i'm i'm pretty sure that uh, that we've made a good, you know, connection with those guys. So when we can, hopefully we can get over there and, and do that show. Yeah, yeah. Fingers crossed um, on on like that that it's it's gonna be better and easier and uh, in in the near future to do those things again. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Um, yeah. We we all we also uh, we we already talked a little bit about the the music and like different approaches over the years that you took uh, with the different albums that you try to to keep it interesting and um yeah with with the very epic and very um melodic um and immediate veil of imagination as 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 i said that 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 was kind of the disney opeth branding that sure. <laughs> um yeah. So there, there is of course this one 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 band that is obviously a, a, a little bit related sonically. Um, Opeth, is there any other um, influences that you would uh, would mention as as uh, important to to your um, to your songwriting? I mean, maybe, maybe just uh, probably just. Uh, 
uh, um oh now now i got a feedback probably just um you know uh, subconsciously of course <laughs> uh, but which would uh, be some some bands that 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 had an impact on 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 you um personally and and as a musician and songwriter yeah i mean it's it's so it's always so hard to pinpoint it exactly i listen to so so much different music um so it's always hard to know exactly which influences go where because there you know there's so many bands i listen to that it's hard to even say if they made their way into wilder run at all but um i know that uh i, I was actually With Epigon in particular, I was listening back because, like I said, I wrote you know some of this material a while ago, and um, and actually, kind of a weird, not as obvious influence on this record was um, an album called Grace by Jeff Buckley, um, mm -hmm. which is one of my absolute favorite albums of all time. And uh, I know that when I was writing some of this material a few years back, I was really listening to that record a lot. So that. I know that Jeff Buckley had a had a pretty big influence on me for this material. Um, also, also ties in with your uh, like like with what you said earlier that you see yourself more as a singer songwriter, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, a lot of my favorite particular artists are singer songwriters, like Jeff Buckley, um, Nick Drake, um, uh, Sufjan Stevens is a big influence of mine. You know, some people a little bit more in the indie folk sort of realm. Um, but yeah, particularly over the last decade, Sufjan Stevens has been a huge influence on me. Um, but as far as like metal goes, um, a big, I, a, I know, uh, I would say Agalock has been one of the biggest influences for me, for sure. They're one of those groups that I just think absolutely created their own thing and took a bunch of different, they took a bunch of different influences on their end and created something that felt completely new and organic. And they've always been a huge influence. Um, and somehow to, being the opposite of an Epigon, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And, uh, a little bit more uh, of an influence for the previous record, but, uh, group called the cardiacs out of out of the uh, united kingdom has definitely always been a huge influence on me and just in terms of uh unconventional harmonic writing uh I was sort of yeah when i when i first heard uh cardiacs i just couldn't believe how they were able to shape together certain core progressions and melodies and, and I, i couldn't even wrap my head around it so that was That, that was definitely a big influence. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Emperor. Emperor has always been a huge... It's from a little more of the black metal side. It's, again, it's just pure songwriting chops. Just, uh, I think it, Emperor is kind of hard to beat uh, just in terms of structuring songs and riffs together. So that's always been a really big influence. Yeah, great, great, great mentions there and, and, and some unexpected as well. It's, I think it's always... Um, especially with prog bands, I mean, prog is uh, supposed not to sound uh, like the 10,000 Dream Theater clone, I think, uh, <laughs> at least as far as I'm concerned, um, we don't, it's, it, there's no need for that. Um, so it's, it's always more interesting and more fun to, to, to hear a little bit about, yeah, the influences that are not necessarily from the prog scene itself. That makes it more, more spicy and more interesting. Um, yeah, I think uh, it was it was really cool to hear some insights uh, into uh, the world of Wilderun. And let's wrap this up. Thank you, Evan, for taking the time. You guys out there, you definitely should check out Epigon and Wilderun. Go like their um, social media pages, follow them, and listen to their amazing music. As always, uh, thank you for listening and thank you for your um, for your interest. We hope you like what we're doing and you can also support us by, by liking, subscribing and commenting everywhere. And uh, that little cup of coffee also helps us out, uh, helps us out a lot. Um, yeah, thanks for listening. Uh, tune in 
again next week when the next episode of the Prog Talks will drop. Until then, take care and keep spreading that Prog love. The Prog Talks, produced by the Prog Space. Main host, Rune Belsvik Reynos. Produced by Rune Belsvik Reynos, Vanessa and Matthias Kirsch. All graphics and animations by Vanessa Kirsch. Intro theme by Giuseppe Negri. Outro theme by Zach Munoviz. This was the Prog Talks by the Prog Space. See you in a week.